Okay, I think we're live. So welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Rokrans and I'll be the host for today uh, for our third installment of our series of online talks convened by Mladi za podnebno pravičnost or Youth for Climate Justice, a grassroots activist movement in Slovenia. So we hope to dedicate these sessions to a broader, more general audience and together with invited guests use this current situation, for lack of a better word, as a point of departure for collective sense making, envisioning and strategy building and solidarity to build the insights and the tools to unmake capitalism for ourselves, each other, future generations and those considered non-human others and to co-create the conditions and structures for co-creating just futures. And today I'm very happy and excited um, to have two guests with us as a kind of change up also in the format. Um, here we have uh, Ariel Saleh and Vandana Shiva. Maybe you can say hi. Hello. Hello. Yeah, hello too, from me, from the Antipodes. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, where are you at the moment? I'm in Sydney. Yeah. Sydney, and I'm, Yeah, and I'm in Dehradun in my childhood home. This is where I got locked down, a good place to get locked down. Hmm. I'm sitting in what used to be my mother's cow shed, which she gifted to me when I wanted to leave university and serve the earth and community. And she said, don't worry, take the cow shed. I turned it into the Research Foundation for Science, Technology and Ecology. Hmm. Excellent bit of history there. Um, so we we talked a little bit uh, before the start of the stream and we said maybe we won't beat around the bush and just maybe start with uh, reflecting kind of on this current situation or this virus hyper object or however we would frame it like this clear symptom of the system right and a stress tester perhaps making visible more so than usual the characteristics of this system. Um, I, know, I know Vandana, you had uh, a lot of things to say about uh, from an ecological perspective on this current situation in a recent blog post. Uh, maybe you could start first with outlining some of your reflections on this. So as I was having to rush back to India, having canceled everything because Corona was shutting everything down, I wanted to get home because I was if before I was locked out somewhere else. Um, I literally wrote this on my trip back. Uh, and it's on the uh, website of navdania.org, the Indian organization, which I started about 32 years ago. Um, and it's reflections on the corona. Simple two reflections. First, that we know we've had an epidemic of new emergent diseases, most of them coming from forests in the last few years, Ebola, the Nile virus, the SARS, and now the corona. We know the virus is a bat virus. What was done along the way with it is not the issue. The issue is bat viruses aren't supposed to become human viruses under normal conditions of balance, respect for limits, and leaving other species, whom you call non-human others, their safe ecological space, their homes. Why have so many forests been cut? in the last two and a half decades of corporate globalization, a lot of people panic when you critique globalization. They don't realize we talking to each other is not globalization as commerce. It is solidarity at the human level and solidarity at the human level did not take birth 25 years ago. What took birth 25 years ago was a World Trade Organization treaty with the intellectual property rights laws written by Monsanto. And that is what made me start Navdanya, the seed saving movement, because Monsanto wanted to own the seed, declaring it as a machine they had invented. I said, no, life is not a machine. It's not your in invention. It's self-evolutionary potential, self-organization. 32 years I've been reflecting on the seed and reflecting of, on the invasions into the seed. Uh, a second treaty was agriculture agreement. 
every place grew its fruit. But when four corporations want to grow four crops and commodities for everyone, they have to invade Indonesian forests to grow palm oil plantations. They have to invade and burn the Amazon to grow GMO soya bean. And they destroyed our agriculture. I remember for the soya bean, they banned Indian edible oils, five lakh, which is uh, 500,000. Gold press oil mills in our villages were made illegal. 98, I had to do a civil disobedience against that law. We saved our oils. The third treaty, sanitary and phytosanitary arrangements and sanitary and phytosanitary agreement. Sounds very good, sounds about safety. Who wrote it? The Pepsis, the Cokes, the Nestles, who panic when women make their own food, who panic when cultures have their artisanal diversity. So every one of these three treaties was a destruction treaty to push seeds in the hands of the poor four poison uh, cartel, Monsanto, which is now bought by Bayer, Syngenta, which has merged with ChemChina, and Dow, which has merged with DuPont, and Dow bought Union Carbide, which in 1984 had a leak from a pesticide plant. That leak killed 7,000 people. Today, the six people who died in that city of Bhopal are all victims of that gas tragedy. So the second point about this invasion is the invasion of poisons by the poison cartel who control agriculture with herbicides and pesticides and uh, fungicides, destroying our bees, destroying our butterflies. And there's a very important initiative that I've agreed to be patron of called Save the Bees and Farmers. It's a European initiative and I hope all of you who are listening will sign it so that we get these poisons out of our systems as well as the systems of all other life on earth. 200,000 people die annually because of pesticide poisoning. We also know 10 million people die because of cancers and they're case on case on case where Monsanto and Bayer have lost because of cancer cases in America, because of Roundup and glyphosate. So you have chronic diseases created by a totally unhealthy food system and then you have invasions into the forests, triggering new emergent epidemics. But if 1% is the mortality of the corona by itself, if you have diabetes, which is a junk food disease, 9.2% is the mortality. If you have cancer, 7.6 is the mortality. So you've got a layer of invasion into forests, invasion into our bodies, the two being conflated, into being reduced in the typical reductionism of the mechanistic mind of capitalist patriarchy into just one virus, when there are multiple causations. And these causations aren't being allowed to be studied in a scientific way. But the final issue about the contemporary context of our being locked in is that so many scientists are saying this is not necessary. So many scientists are saying the better way to deal with these issues is not shut people down to build the next step of a greed-based economy which brought us to this situation in the first place. And that I think is a discussion we should have. What are the kinds of economies we want in the future? What are the kinds of democracy that will not allow a cartel of five billionaires to control half the wealth of the world and decide what they'll do with our lives and our minds. That's the challenge standing in front of us. And what are the alternatives that we must build for the future of all species? Thank you so much, Vandana. Uh, maybe I'd give the word to Ariel for a response or her own reflections in this situation. Well, there, there are so many points there, but um... Perhaps because uh, you're interested to introduce ecofeminist understandings into Slo Slovenia, uh, to take up her point about the capitalist patriarchal mechanistic mind 
and to suggest that you know one of the classic very early 1980 1980 exactly 80 81 studies uh, by Carolyn Merchant called the death of nature uh, uh, women and the scientific revolution I think was that was that the correct title uh, yeah. Vandana? yeah sometimes I get your book and her book the titles mixed up together and uh, Merchant who's a historian of science um, showed how that originally the European mindset was organic, organistic, like uh, as are most other cultures on earth and uh, that humans understood themselves as, as part of that great organism. Um, but with the scientific revolution, the notion came that the earth was a machine, could be understood as a machine, the human body, medicine, the rise of medicine could be treated as a machine. And of course, in the process of establishing this new mindset, millions of women were rounded up uh, and put to death as witches because women's knowledge, women's knowledge of natural medicines, um, food growing and so forth was to be replaced by professionalized uh, capitalist patriarchal. And at that point, capitalism was uh, still emergent um, but you can see how it's really important when we discuss these capitalist projects that we understand them as embedded in, in patriarchal and attitudes uh, fundamentally. So it's always important to use the two terms together. And in doing that, I always see patriarchal system as the noun and capitalist as the adjective, because capitalism is only the most recent form of this aberrant social organization. So. I might, I'm not sure what else to take up from what Vandana has said. I mean, perhaps again, going on, on uh, further on this notion of capitalism and the role of the pharmaceutical corporations um, with, with uh, petro farming, uh, as she so aptly names it, uh, pest, artificial pesticides, fertilizers, and so on. We're now looking at the pharmaceuticals very much involved in the corona situation and exploring uh, massive investments going into development of vaccines and so forth. Uh, so there's a great wave of capitalist expansion on the brink at that point. Um, very hurriedly too, I might add, probably possibly not time for proper scientific testing. So, it's very important, I think, to look at the political economy of these things. Uh, yeah. Excellent. Thank you. Um, maybe Vandana, if you have any direct response. Otherwise, I do have a kind of question prepared. Yeah. One, one little addition that big pharma is big poison too. The same companies, Bayer now owns Monsanto. But Bayer is a pharmaceutical company. Pfizer is the mother, mother, mother of what Monsanto was, pharmaceutical company. So if you look at them, basically, at the you know, standard oil became the monopoly of oil. In Hitler's Germany, there were chemical companies whose original work was to substitute the natural dyes Indian, India used to provide, like the indigo. And they wanted chemical substitute because you know a bag of indigo used to be paid for in a bag of gold. So the chemical companies which started with dyes were put on the job of making chemicals to gas people in the concentration chamber uh, camps. That cartel was called IG Farben. It was tried in Nuremberg for crimes against humanity. All of human rights flows out of that. But tragically, the chemicals they produced didn't stop with the Nuremberg cartel, they became agrotoxins and agrochemicals and became the defining feature of an agriculture, which destroyed all of the organic agricultures. They were called organic farming. Albert Harvard came to India and said, oh my God, we need to learn from the peasants and wrote a book called The Agricultural Testament. Um, these same companies, so Standard Oil was actually with IG Farben. There was a joint company called IG Farben, Standard Oil. And my book, Oneness Versus 1%, which is going to be coming out in Slovenian, 
uh, has these very deep details. But a Rockefeller who owned Standard Oil also used petrochemicals to make the early pharmaceuticals. It's not that we didn't know how to heal. Most chemicals that heal, actually heal like cunane, comes from the bark of the chinchona. And it is in this big, you know, the synthetic version is this big talk of the hydroxychloroquine. So the witch hunts that Ariel talked about was at that time about exterminating the real knowledge keepers, which were women. And that was the death of nature book by Caroline Merchant. But the witch hunts were related at the same time to the rise of the mechanistic mind. And the mechanistic mind was defined as a mind outside the body. So Descartes talked about having to escape from the body and disembodied knowledge then became the privileged knowledge and Ariel has written so much about embodied knowing. What we are witnessing right now, in my view, is kind of the final contest between capitalist patriarchy, its assumption of capital as an active creator of wealth when all it is is a construct in the hands of powerful men. And I like what you said, Ariel, that the noun is patriarchy. It's current capitalist. And we will need a non-patriarchal, non-capitalist future. The very defining of nature as dead is at the heart of saying, oh, you need chemicals for soil fertility because soil is an empty container. You need genetic engineering for the seed. I, I fight cases on Monsanto in the courts where the Monsanto actually gets up and says, the seed is an empty container and we put chemicals that make it a Superman. Mm -hmm. And our bodies are empty containers for all the new experimentation of big pharma, big ag combined and big IT, they're part of it. They've all merged. The money machine about which I talk in my book, Oneness One versus the 1% is a final combination of the money and the machine in one material base. And their final attempt to invade our bodies and minds in every way they can. And our final challenge to say, no, we are autonomous beings. We will be free. We will invent our freedoms. That will be our work for the next one or two decades. Now, I think the dissociation of body and mind a uh, dissociation of humanity and nature, dissociation of man versus woman, two dualistic, uh, two, two, two distinct uh, models there. Um, th this, this dissociation is actually the first principle or first premise of the patriarchal mindset. And uh, it creates it, we see it now even in the uh, uh, computer industry where everything is based on an algorithm and the, the one zero, uh, it's, everything is either this or that. Um, even politics gets reduced down. It has to be a contest between Republican or Democrat or, you know, North versus South and so on and so on. And this is, uh, it's so different. I was thinking about Vandana today because, you know, she uh, uh, began her career as a quantum physicist. Yes, I think, in quantum physics. Yeah. And, um, I, I, I'm sure this, uh, when you decided to leave it, but in your, your feeling for relation, uh, relationality and levels of complexity comes through then when you turned your eyes to nature, um, as you did at a certain point, I think was about 19, maybe the end of 1970s or 80. But let's talk a bit, I'm really interested in the epistemology of the West, which is so sick, um, but maybe you can, elaborate a little bit more. You will elaborate a little bit more. Well, I'll only add this much. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I was studying to be a physicist and the algorithms because the propaganda machine of Monsanto has had to work so hard to say I never studied physics. You know, they have to prove that I never studied physics. I'm not a scientist. So when I critique them for biosafety, for which I was a UN expert for the biosafety protocol of the Convention on Biological Diversity, their algorithms have been taught that if I mention my MSc honors in physics, uh, my computer dies. It's fascinating. I watched the algorithms at work in my own life. Amazing surveillance systems have been created with trigger words, yeah? I was studying uh, physics. And um, then I realized that the mechan mechanistic system didn't hang together with what 
we were seeing in particle physics. So I did a PhD in the foundations of quantum theory. And when I was leaving, I actually went to visit a forest which had disappeared. And that's what made me a volunteer for Chipko. So I kind of did two, the two things together, I was doing my PhD, come back for vacations, volunteer for this amazing movement of hugging the trees. And our freedom will be when the lockdown is over to come and hug the earth. I want the young people yes. to hug each other, hug the earth and say, okay, one year, two year, we gave you whatever you wanted, but not beyond that, we are very sorry. Hugging has to be the way we live with the earth and each other. So quantum theory taught me, my thesis was on non-separation and non-locality. In quantum theory, things are not separate. The mechanistic idea is the dissociation idea. Everything is separate. Second, the reason they got away with so much hate in Hitler's Germany or others was the essentializing of inferiority, yeah? Of the Jew, the women, they got away with making African slaves by saying the Africans aren't fully human. They're objects and commodities to be owned. This essentializing of quality and property is another part of that epistemology. Whereas in quantum theory, there's nothing is fixed essential. It's essential waiting to happen. And that's why I want to tell the surveillance masters, the big tech of today, who are playing behind the scenes to create a surveillance capitalism, which will be the new phase of capitalist patriarchy. You can try as hard as you want. Yes. It's been tried before with the slaves, with the witch hunts. We will not go extinct. We will not disappear. Life will win over any capitalist project that is death creating. Yeah. It's, it's so fantastic, I think, that we see young people today intuiting this, knowing this already um, as they, um, I mean, we have a lot to share with them too, but that they have a, they, they have a direction. I, I was thinking, you know, um, it, it, it's kind of nice that uh, you, you asked Bandana and myself to come together on this because we both come from such incredibly different backgrounds. Uh, you know, in, in every way, I mean, class, race, gender, blah, blah, education. In fact, my introduction to relational thinking came through Sigmund Freud because I was training to be a psych uh, psychiatrist, psychoanalyst. And um, he, his understanding, his intuitive understanding of the processes of the mind uh, is incredibly relational and critically exciting. And I still use it a lot in thinking about social processes. But getting back to I think in a way, um, I'm, it must be 30 years, Vandana, since I have known you now, and or even more little, and, and uh, but that we both arrive at precisely the same understanding of what, what was wrong with the world and where it was, despite our diverse, very diverse backgrounds, uh, diverse women for diversity, as somebody once said. And, um, I think that typifies ecofeminism, that ecofeminism is actually a universal perspective and it emerges organically from women's lived experience in attempting to hold life together, the conditions of life together. And um, for me, I was struggling as a, a young single mother um, and very concerned about um, the nuclear testing and uh, uranium mining in Australia and, and Witnessing then it was on indigenous land, so already you begin to understand the, the, the need for a decolonial dimension to this. And in Vardana's case, of course, she was uh, working in the forests in the, in the first instance. But um, I'd like to emphasize that point that, that I think ecofeminism comes out of praxis. It might have a few theoretical elements to it, but it's actually a lived philosophy that people build up from their, their own engagement with, with the material world. And one of the perhaps unfortunate things that's happened along the time since the late seventies, when women first started uh, becoming publicly assertive about environmental questions and environmental social ecological questions um, was the universities got involved and uh, of course, universities are the quintessential bourgeois 
instruments of divide and rule and setting up um, expertise, one expertise against another expertise, which of course safely advances knowledge and contains it at the same time and constrains it at the same time. Um, and, but in, and, and universities are extremely competitive places. And even for young women who may enter with ideals, soon find themselves in capitalist patriarchal machinery uh, where it's dog eat dog and where theory is fashion and every decade the sociological analysis falls from one paradigm into another paradigm into another paradigm and ecofeminism very quickly was taken up by universities and there was liberal environmentalism which really isn't ecofeminism, although there are some liberal environmentalist feminists around who people assume are ecofeminists. Uh, they tend to put the emphasis on state regulation and so forth. Um, there were socialist feminists who reframed ecological feminist thinking within their paradigm, tamed it to a certain extent. Um, you know, capitalism became the noun. Um, there were post-structural feminists who tended to reduce feminist theory to disc discourse, structures of discourse. And, um, and then you would begin to get competition between these different academicized eco-feminisms so I, I just want to draw attention to that because I think if young women are coming through and they're genuinely committed to making social change and they are attracted by the idea of this tradition of women taking control of the conditions of life itself or, and their environments um, and protecting them and nurturing them, it's really important that they can recognize when those things are happening. Yeah. Thanks so much for that reflection. And I think it's really appreciated in the context also of what we're trying to do with this specific talk. Uh, we also talked a bit uh, before the stream about um, well, ecofeminism not really being uh, organized in any sense in Slovenia currently. Um, although I'm happy to say like, for example, uh, the new issue for a journal for the critique of science where we're um, issuing a translation of, of your work, Ariel, uh, your uh, article in the, um, what was it, uh, uh, Handbook for Ecological Economics, uh, edited by Klaus Pasch. Um, but also there's uh, a few other organizations I could um, kind of mention. Institute 8 March is a, is a quite strong institution here in Slovenia for, for women's rights. Um, there's uh, yeah, ECOSI, which is Ecological Civil Initiative of Slovenia. Um, we, have, uh, we don't know them very well, or I don't know them very well currently, but this uh, setting up this talk has been also an excellent uh, exercise in, in mapping out uh, these spheres in Slovenia. And there's also the Permaculture Association of Slovenia, which is doing some great work. Um, and we also found some individual researchers or small groups um, but with more like on and off public talks and the like roundtables. For example, a few months ago, there was one on ecofeminism in the novels of Ursula Le Guin. Um, I, I did not uh, attend, but uh, it sounds really interesting. Um, also from that kind of speculative fiction and then how that opens up uh, new ways of thinking. Um, and so, yeah, I think this uh, this reflection is really key and it was kind of one of the uh, talking points also of, of what would you advise maybe for young people, uh, young women uh, entering the field or learning about it here or maybe now for the first time, I think. Uh, so, yeah. Would you comment on that right at the start that made me want to say what I just said and it, 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 I, I repeat, I think you use the phrase um, People are concerned because ecofeminism is not an organized movement. And this is the difference. Ecofeminism is an organic expression of people's concern. And it is learned by doing. 
uh, the movements, Marxism, Foucault, post-structuralism, whatever, whatever, social ecology, lots of great ideas. I use them myself in my work, but they are all versions of mansplain and they're all top down, um, somewhat acad academicized. Uh, it's a separation of body and mind, all right, which is then translated into politics. That's what I'm trying to say. Whereas the eco-feminist politics, which I have spent almost a lifetime looking at now, um, as I say, it, it, it is spontaneous and it grows out of engagement. It, it doesn't have to, okay, women have woven explanations and stories and so on about it, um, but it's not a religion. It's not like Catholicism or Marxism or social ecology or whatever from the, the mind of a great man out to learn, to gird yourself up, to follow, not that. It's not like that. Uh, and men can be feminist as much as, as women, if they're involved in care labor and nurturing living processes. And in fact, that's one of the reasons I have ended up writing a lot about what I call meta-industrial labor which is slightly a little dig in the ribs at Marxism, but also really seriously and genuinely me meant that that kind of regenerative labor, um, it's the, the definition of the labor is in the material quality of the work itself. And the, and the quintessential aspect of that work is that it, it's human engagement and respond responsiveness to natural processes. That's the key thing, which is the precise opposite of the division between nature, humanity and nature, or man and the um, And I, I'd add to uh, what Ariel has just said, that uh, ecofeminism isn't a ism. It is the burst of energy that realized Nothing. that no, I love that. True. It's not true that nature is dead. Nature is very alive. And it is not true that women are a passive second sex. We, our work, our body's work is holding the work. When I started to work on structural adjustment in the World Bank, I realized the only reason societies were still running were women. Hmm. We're doing four times the amount of work. But because women's work is encountered, because capitalism created measures like the GDP, gross domestic product, which says, if you produce what you consume, you don't produce. But the only real production of things that matter is when you produce what you consume. You grow your food and you eat it. When you grow commodities to export and import junk food, that's not an economy, it is a diseconomy because economy is supposed to be care for the earth and care for the household. So if ecofeminism is lived and embodied and it's about life and co-creation with nature, then it's not about women alone. It's about men waking up to that possibility, including their own possibility. Because I feel not only did women get dominated, and more burden was put on them for work while they, it was said they don't work. Men were forced to live lives and have emotions according to this mechanical box that violence is the na essential nature of man. Domination is the essential nature of man. None risk. of it. Yeah, yeah. risk. Yeah. I mean, today, if you notice with the coronavirus, the two figures that really need to be taken seriously is it's not that we didn't have good things to eat, but local markets were shut down and Amazon has increased, Jeff Bezos individually has increased his wealth in just the last month by $24 billion. Mm -hmm. And BlackRock, which didn't exist till the financial crisis of 2008, became 7 billion trillion last year but the bailouts that are being given are money to companies and yes. billionaires. That yes. money is going into the asset funds. 
my book oneness was 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 the one percent was written because a i couldn't understand how bill gates was telling governments what to do and was more powerful than heads of state in the paris climate treaty it's the climate agreement that made me write that book and then i realized by the time we were writing it i've written it with my son um that by and bought with Sancho, but then we wanted to see, you know, how does the money move? We realized, well, neither of them are really independent corporations. They're owned by these vanguards and Black Rocks. So how much has Black Rock increased during the crisis? Well, everyone's made to panic. Stay home, stay home, stay home. Black Rock is 23 trillion worth now. Now that economy is a genocidal economy because it's taking away livelihood. I mean, in India, Half of India today has no food. And okay, the stores and the stocks will feed them for one season. But if no one's working and no one's on the farms, what's going to happen? So this is an ecocidal and genocidal economy. And if we care for the earth and our diversity. And one of the things I'd really like the young people to know is we will make this division issue of the patriarchal mind separated climate from biodiversity, from the soil, extinction from climate from change, but the and, the all, and, and the health disasters and epidemics. But the same processes that lead to new epidemics like corona, that deforestation is contributing to climate change. Chemical farming, if you add every element of it, the production of synthetic fertilizers, fossil fuel use, long distance transport, food miles, packaging, processing, add it all up, it's about 45 to 50% of the greenhouse gases. Same system is giving you the disease epidemic and same system has led to species extinction. All intergovernmental panel on climate change, intergovernmental panel on biodiversity. They're saying the same thing. If you don't look to the land, You'll never be able to find climate solutions because it's the destruction of this biosphere for the fossil fuels that has led to all the crises. You use chemical synthetic fertilizers and pesticides and herbicides like Roundup, you're going to have species extinction. We'd better stop using chemicals that are chemicals of extinction. We'd better stop using Roundup ready GMOs, which are designed for extinction. And we should not let Bill Gates get away with gene editing and gene drives with other new GMOs he wants deregulated. They created super weeds like amaranth and now he wants gene drives to make amaranth extinct. This man has to be brought under control if you're going to have a future which is democratic and where life can in her self-life freedom. The idea that Every blade of grass, every seed, every plant, every bee, under, every butterfly is self-organized. That's the idea that the mechanistic mind doesn't get. And that's why they don't get the idea that you can have a community of autonomous self-organized people interacting deeply through interconnectedness and their dependence on each other, but not invading into each other's spaces. The idea of atomistic existence and invasion versus self-organized autonomy and interconnectedness of respect with everyone, of everyone, every human being, every diverse being. Like my colleague, uh, Ashish Kadari, who, who helped uh, put together the Pluriverse book, Ashish has a marvelous expression uh, which is uh, what we, we, we want to create precisely what Vanda is talking about, livelihoods, to protect livelihoods, not deadlyhoods. And this is why the Western mindset, it creates nothing but deadlyhoods and our present situation is a good example of it. I wanted to, um, I'm still thinking about young people and thinking about, uh, oh, actually there was something I wanted also just to add, that in their dissociated approach to climate, uh, which puts the whole focus on carbon counting uh, and a single issue variable, uh, dissociating the carbon from the whole water cycle. The carbon cycle and the water cycle are intermarried. And uh, with the increasing privatization of the global water supply, um, it, it is uh, uh, that and uh, the, the failure to link 
the protection of our water bodies to, to the climate and atmospheric um, hydrology. Um, we, uh, it's another aspect that, that we really need to take hold of. Um, I've written a little bit about this. I'm sure actually Vandana's written a lot more about it too. And um, that's something I would love to see a lot more young people getting into, keeping working on climate and water together, together. And the Eastern Europeans have done a lot of work on this. In fact, in the article which I shared with you, Rock, uh, you'll see a little bit of discussion on that. But, but getting back to um, uh, there is no organized eco-feminist movement here in our country, as you, you said. said. Um, Maybe I would just add and, to that, uh, just, just as an, yeah, that uh, the phrasing was probably not the best here. But I would also say that it's... Sorry, uh, the we? Phrasing was not, he's taking it back. <laughs> I'm taking back the phrasing. We lost it. I also uh, thought to, to uh, just say that, yeah, uh, as also, Ariel, you mentioned, like, uh, theory as fashion and, and uh, things like this. Um, so also, as a person myself, I saw that, you know, I made this transition from, like, oh, thinking of some, you know, high tower of academia or something then you know uh you you kind of discover that decolonialism isn't like the new fashion term that you should you know but it's it's a it's a very uh very intense personal practice that uh, to unmake those dualisms ingrained in you through the system uh, yes. so i'm very happy for that intervention uh, and yeah. remember that, that, that it, it, in some ways it's even harder for young men than for young women because uh, as you start to firm up your, your identity, um, what are your options, you know, the patriarchal system? And it's more than just what you're conscious of. At a very deep uh, subliminal level, there is the very early infantile need to break from the mother and the nurture of the mother and to identify with the father, you know, what Freud called the Oedipal complex. In Freud's story, of course, the son rises up and kills the father and eats him. However, by eating him, he ingests the father's values and therefore civilization is safe and carried forward into the future. But anyway, be that as it may, um, for, for young men, uh, Taking this uh, capitalist patriarchal civilization by the horns is an, in almost a double challenge, I would say. Yeah. Hmm. Thanks. Uh, yeah, we've got our work cut out for ourselves. Uh, <laughs> hear that Slovenian voice. Um, yeah, but to, to kind of go back to some of your points, um, I think uh, well, one of the things we like to outline in these talks is also like some some cr concrete alternatives and proposals that that are rising here and Vandana I think you gave some excellent starting points for that conversation in terms of our non-capitalist future inventing our future and your you know a strong uh, cause for relocalization um, I think that's a very interesting conversation also in terms of yeah let's say you know, uh, Western institutions and so on, and, and discourses about these things. Uh, well, basic income is obviously a very salient one and, and completely permeated by, yeah, whatever we name it. But there's also some very interesting, if we like uh, start speaking in terms of universal basic services um, that uh, and relocalization and uh, participation of people and actually co-creating these socioeconomic system services. Um, I think we go into a, a very interesting field of conversation of how we could be engaged in co-creating this transition. Uh, so that was one uh, reflection that uh, we well, could talk about. Can I just come, can you hear me? Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, um, those sort of proposals suggest that the state is going to play a central role in your future and um, I wonder because many, many young people are putting more emphasis on community renewal, uh, autonomous grassroots communities and self-sufficiency. And there's a tension, there's really two distinct models there. And up, 
Are people, are your groups, are they examining which way they want to go? I mean, we've really been looking at the state uh, now for what, 500 years or more. And uh, certainly it's not functioning now. Uh, is, is the state by definition uh, a patriarchal institution? I mean, there are old feminists like Mary O'Brien who would suggest that um, institutions like religion and the state and so forth are symbols of continuity which have a psychological function uh, in a dissociated uh, culture. I just leave you leave that with you. <laughs> mm. Yeah, I, I think opening up the question of the state is, is key here. And I was thinking both in terms of, you know, it's a very big if uh, hypothetical of um, uh, the state giving, like creating a deliberative framework, like, or is, is that demand coming from civil society and so on? How is this deliberative forum established is a question. And also in terms of who is quote unquote governing or what are the modes of governance of, of these uh, kind of service provision systems, care systems, uh, also going beyond you know, the production, reproduction dualisms, what do you like mean essentially. Care systems. Care systems. Care uh, system. It is women and men who care and farmers who care and indigenous people who care for life processes. What is this care systems? Uh, uh, spontaneous, uh, again, uh, blur. <laughs> <laughs> um, can I come in here? Okay, so I have a book called Earth Democracy and I wrote it after we brought WTO to a halt in Seattle, 1999, because the media would constantly say the anti-globalization mo movement knows what it's against, but it doesn't know what it's for. And we said, no, we know what we are for. We're for the earth. Therefore, we will not let you patent seeds. We are for the farmers. Therefore, we will not let Cargill take over. We are for healthy food and our cultural traditions of eating. That's why we won't let Pepsi, Coke, and Nestle decide what junk food they shove down our throats. Now, we knew the center. And protectionism as if it was a sin to protect. And I think we've got to reclaim the word protection because you can't have care without protection. You've got to protect the forest. You've got to protect the river. You've got to protect the air. You've got to protect biodiversity. You have to protect your indigenous cultures. So Earth Democracy was the book. And I said, what we have is an economy that's killing life and the planet. A democracy is that's very dead because at that time the Iraq war took place and people were marching in millions and no government listened. Um, and we are watching a democracy of separation where the same algorithms put leaders in power and they totally dissociated from the public. And finally, cu cultures, because at the same time, Samuel Huntington wrote a book I cannot know who I am till I know who I hate. Mm -hmm. And the eco-feminist philosophy is, I know who I am because I know who I love and who I care for. So these are foundational cracks that have been imposed and the corona experiment, you know, I keep thinking, I said, how do the indigenous people feel when out of the blue, these Europeans came? How did the women feel when witch hunt started. How did the Africans feel when suddenly they were picked up and made slaves? We are at that kind of moment for all of humanity today. It's that kind of non-natural phenomena which is being called a natural phenomena. And that's why in my reflection, I've called it anthropocentric. It is as anthropocentric as climate change. It is made and driven because of the irresponsibility of a few greedy men driving an economy, making it look like it's the only kind of economy. And we have to start realizing that when, when we care, we are running an economy. The second thing is for the climate and soil and water links. I have a book called Soil Not Oil and it's available. Um, and if the lockdown is lifted, I hope some of you will come to the Earth University I started for learning co-creation by living co-creation. 
because I think just this learning of the head, you can't distinguish when it's fake and when it's real. If you're taught year after year that soil is an empty container, you will learn how to measure how much nitrogen fertilizer to apply. When you live with the soil and realize it's full of living organisms, then you build your relationship with the soil. It leads to very different actions. So the Earth University has a course in September. I hope the lockdown is lifted on the A to Z of the shift on the transition of living seed, living soil, living food, living economies, living knowledges and creating living cultures of community. Final thing I'd like to add to what Ariel has already said. Uh, and you know, the West created dependency on the state. Countries like ours had communities. No matter how you reclaim the commons, the universal issues of the right to health, the right to food, not just for humans, because none of these rights are for humans alone. The right to water is for all beings who need water. The right to food is all beings in the food web, which is the web of life. And this is what my work has been in Navdanya, that the web of life and the, the uh, cycle of life is really a food cycle. And to get this in place, we need every level, but the recovery of the commons and the resistance to enclosures of any commons has to be our work of creating the democracy of the future. Yes. Three cheers. <laughs> yes, I, I think to, to examine uh, uh, the convergence and divergences between the commons model and the state model is very important to have a look. Yeah. Mm. Excellent. Yeah, that, that was also kind of the, the, the direction where I was heading. How, how do you apply? Uh, commons principles to kind of, uh, provisioning systems that are co-created um, but but also doing that from from within the current situation as a practice as you say um, yeah I think the either or model I mean quantum theory tells you there's nothing like either or it's not the something a particle can't be a wave it's a wave and can't be a particle it can be both yeah so wherever you are, if, if the universal rights are being ensured through a welfare state, make sure it isn't weakened for privatization and dismantling. Defend it while you deepen the community initiatives. Where there is no welfare state, ensure that the state doesn't become a corporate state to mm -hmm. rush through the agenda of the next stage of a capitalism, which can only be a surveillance capitalism. It has no other future, you know? Mm -hmm. It cannot, and this surveillance capitalism is digital agriculture in food, where Monsanto is talking of farming without farmers. It is fake food. Silicon Valley is investing hugely in fake food, having crops that become carbohydrates and proteins to assemble into anything. You can make a door with it, and you can turn it into your food and you can turn it into a meat burger that's not meat. And this is a big new fashion of impossible food which has sold a hundred new proteins, fake proteins. But here is the real community. We are part of nature. That separation between nature and us is what cost us the coronavirus. It is what has cost us chronic diseases. We now know the biodiversity of the forest, the biodiversity on the farm, and the biodiversity of our gut microbiome is super organized, but in terms of self-organization. We have nearly 60 trillion to 100 trillion microbes in our gut. Only 60. Are, uh, only six are human cells. Our body is made of other beings. Yeah, our, our, we are other beings. Not only are we dependent on them outside, they're creating us, they're making our brain work, otherwise we have neurological problems. That's why all the problems of dementia, autism, et cetera. So we are nature. We are not outside nature, we are not separate, and definitely a few capitalist patriarchs aren't masters. We need to make sure this crisis 
is the end mm. of the mastery age and yes. begins the age of procreation. Yes. That is what the invitation of this mega crisis is for. Indeed. Excellent. Um, I would propose that maybe I would pose one of the questions that came in through the stream. It's related to, um, or maybe I can just read it out and you can, you can formulate your responses. It, it's by Joost and it goes like this. Uh, you mentioned ecofeminism not as an organization, but as an organic response to exploitation experienced by people. I rewarded it a bit. What does that mean for abolishing patriarchy? That an alternative as a functioning replacement of patriarchy and capitalism for that matter will also appear organically? Aren't we in a situation that requires organized action with a clear political program? Um, well, I think the, clear, the program is clear. Van Damme's articulated uh, extremely clearly there that that um, the first thing, I think the first thing we have to agree on is that humans are nature in embodied form. So then everything we do and everything we see every day, we can ask ourselves, is this represented here? Am I acting in such a way that I believe this? Uh, how could we do things differently in our group if we really believe this? That's a, that would be one small answer. That, that, um, that the strongest uh, challenge to, to patriarchal institutions that you can possibly conceive of. No guns, no swords, no fists. And no pyramids, no pyramids. We've got five billionaires controlling half the wealth of the world. I, when, well, one is versus one percent, when I wrote it, when I started to write it, and did the data. There were about 300 of them 10, 10 years ago. Then they became 100, then they became a 60, then they became 30, then they became five. That's the level of concentration. But this level of concentration is based on extraction. And therefore it's becoming an inverted pyramid where the base that supports it, which is nature and people, women, workers, they are being squeezed and they've been ultimately squeezed with the lockdown. You've got an upside down pyramid. What happens yes. with an upside down pyramid? It topples. Yes. So it right. needs the next step of coercion to keep holding it in place. But when you are puzzled about having an equal strength, it doesn't mean you get an equal strength of an inverted pyramid because it's a stupid idea to go for. You need the strength that Gandhi talked about, where we know if every microbe is self-organized and then is working with 60 trillion microbes in our gut, shouldn't we be taking a lesson from the microbes to say, oh, you're organized, you're holding this human body up or the soil organisms, millions and billions of them, they're organized, they know exactly what to do. Someone telling you from outside what to do isn't organization, it's imposition, it's colonialism, it's dictatorship. Organizing from within and having ever expanding oceanic circles, never ascending, never dominating, this horizontal expansion. We even imagine that scaling up can only go vertically. This linear vertical mine has brought us to very, very bad problems. We need to start getting horizontality into our hearts and our minds, circularity that thinks the recycle and solidarity. Those are the shifts that will create huge shifts with tiny steps of people working in trust, humility and solidarity. Thank you so much. I think that uh, kind of addresses a lot of this implied in this kind of the strategy of transformation, but you're alluding also to kind of the epistemological shift uh, offered through ecofeminism. Uh, thank you. I'm, I'm trying to kind of yeah. be cautious of what I say now here with, with this. You just say nature's alive, women are alive, women are intelligent. We all have put power. <laughs> That's ecofeminism. Yeah. We all are powerful. 
excellent. Uh, maybe I would open another question from, from our stream that just came in. Uh, it concerns uh, liberal feminism uh, and, and like uh, socialist feminism. So the question goes uh, from Nika. Uh, quite often there is this belief that people, especially cis men, that define themselves as progressive from the left, liberal, etc., are by definition also feminists. However, in reality, this is not true, at least in my case, how to tackle the question of feminism within the left and liberal. Um, there, there seem to be two crossing over uh, elements to that question. Um, first of all, let me just, I'll just sort of try and tease it apart a little bit. So a liberal feminism is basically masculine identified. Um, this is uh, the middle class uh, feminism based on equal rights, equal pay, the right to termination and so forth, um, which allows women to enter into their lives on, on a par with men, but according to the same capitalist patriarchal values which dominate the system. So it might achieve structural, it hasn't in fact, we've been going for 35 or 40 years and women are still even in advanced society, so-called advanced societies are only earning two thirds of what a man of the same qualifications and job is paid. But um, uh, liberal feminism, so it's the individual uh, attainment on equivalent structural terms in the given society. So it's really not a radical position at all. It's, it's actually quite a conservative position. Um, now, uh, with the preoccupation with transgendering, I think that was another aspect of the question, yes? Um, when you have trans men or trans women, um, that, that tends to fall under the liberal preoccupation because it's about individual choice, individual lifestyle choice, the right to live your chosen sexual expression and so on. So it's not actually dealing with say a socialist feminism or an ecological feminism, which is dealing with structural issues so much st structural inequality. I don't know, Ivana, if you want to add on, add to that, elaborate on that. Mm. Did you hear, right? Vandana, did you want to add to that? To well, you know, I live in India. I am not even in these debates because they're not part of, you know, our preoccupation is half of India going to starve, you know? It did. Certainly in India, um, it seems as though, I mean, I personally think that there is a whole spectrum of sexualities. Oh, yeah. Uh, I mean, if you come to that, those, cho I mean, the, the, uh, it goes into ancient times, into ancient times. But like you said, it wasn't atomized into the individual. Yes. It was part of community and interconnectedness with deep respect, not being treated like outcasts. But at the center, at the center of ceremonies, when you have a birth or, you know, the transgenders are at your doorstep. So uh, I do think societies need to recognize that these issues are not new inventions, but they're being disembodied mm. is new. You know, and just, you know has pluralism of sexuality yeah. existed in ways that didn't make it a burden of the individual, you see. I think the problem with the, the liberal idea of, uh, uh, you know, like Margaret Thatcher said, there's no society, there's only individuals, that carried too far into an atomization of identity, then creates a huge burden of having to construct identity rather than multiple complex relationships allowing you to live comfortably with yourself, including, I keep repeating, the gut microbiomes, you know, <laughs> comfortable with the non-human other who is part of your human being. I hope that came somewhere near answering the question. No. <laughs> I think that that will be fine. Um, so, yeah, just okay, maybe... 
questions between um, mm -hmm. um, a, a man question and a woman question and a man question and a woman question? Can we alternate the... How long uh, are we going to go? I thought it was a one hour. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that, that was, uh, I was going to say that uh, we're now kind of five minutes over, so to say, so... Yeah, five um, minutes. We are over, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Maybe we can uh, keep the rest for another time. Mm. I think that's perfectly fine. Also to, to uh, Ariel, the, the first comment was from Joost, who is uh, male, Nika the second is female. Okay. I think we got that. Uh, well done. Cover. Um, yeah, I think maybe any closing remarks, otherwise uh, uh, we can, yeah. I'll only say one sentence. So, We've had inequality created through colonialism and other things. But the welfare state created some form of equality which is being dismantled. And I remember when at the lead up to the Earth Summit, we used to do a lot of training of youth. I'm talking of 92. And if we use the word justice and equality, which is so important to us, because for you justice and equality meant the communist state, People would freeze and go red. They couldn't deal with that word, you know? It had become a nasty word. I think today we have to realize that inequality has become so brutal. And during the Corona crisis, I feel an experiment is underway. And this language is used by a lot of writers. We now have to decide who will be allowed to live and who will not be allowed to live. So the have and have nots has become a live and live not. And that is against any principle of a philosophy based that every life, every human life, every insect life has a right to live. And not, and no other human being, including a state, including a billionaire has the right to say, you can go. You are not needed. Hitler tried it through his genocide. We cannot allow an economy based on assumptions of who will live and who will die being decided by some powerful men. So this is a testing time in multiple ways, multiple, multiple ways. And I think the most important thing is for all young people, no matter where they are, to see what is the future they want, which can be a future not of selfishness and greed, and isolation, but a future of community and interconnectedness. Yes. And I give Shiva the last word. <laughs> Excellent. Oh, thank you both so much for, for joining us here today. It's been excellent. Um, Maybe I can also give a, a shout out that, uh, well, on this Friday, we will be uh, joined by, well, three old white males, uh, Dan <laughs> Todorkov, uh, Brian Tokar, and uh, Gideon Kosov, who have kind of, um, well, been, been in the social ecology circles since the 80s. I'll definitely be forwarding them this talk, and maybe they can take something from, uh, from this in, in their you can say hello to Brian, who's also been a fighter against GMOs with us. Yes. Excellent. Thanks to me, actually. I, I was the one that put him on to that in 1987. Mm. Vandana, I hope you appreciate that. <laughs> okay, good luck. Good luck. Cheers. Bye now. Bye.